In Matthew chapter 12 and verse 24, Beelzebub is called the prince of the devils. And a better translation of the word devils there is the word demons. Uh, there aren't many devils. There are demons. There's one devil. And apparently that's a reference to an angel that had fallen uh, from their high estate. We're told that over in the book of uh, 1 Peter and, and also in Jude there's a reference to that. Of an angel that had, uh, angels that had fallen from their estate. And also the word ruler is, transla is translated the word ruler. The King James and the American Standard use the word prince here. But anyway, it's one possessing some rank and perhaps some authority. But as we notice further, the, the world over which Satan rules is mankind in, in alienation from God. So if we'll keep that in mind, he's in alienation from God. And while the world appears to be Satan's uh, empire or his sphere of operation, as a matter of fact, what he produces in the world, sin and death, actually become his empire. And so the world in this ethical sense, the Bible teaches us, is laden in sin and in need of salvation. And in this realm, men loved darkness more than they did light. They loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. There's still people like that today that love darkness more than light. We're told to love not this world, neither the things that are in the world and what kind of things they are over in 1 John chapter 2. Where sin reigns, spiritual death also reigns because the wages of sin is death. We're told in Romans 6 and verse 23. Uh, we might notice also, I don't know why this is doubling those things up, but it is. As we think about the prince of the power of the air, that particular phrase, we looked at the other one just now, the prince of this world. The prince of the power of the air, the, the uh, only difference in this passage and the one we just looked at is, is this phrase. He's called the prince of the power of the air. And that seems to refer to the atmosphere around the earth. Uh, that's the way people would have understood that. And so why this particular mention of the air uh, as the place where Satan is, is can't be known for sure. We don't know that for sure. There's some possibilities. It may mean no more than that the air is the place where Satan dwells as the chief ruler or prince of the demons and uh, the evil spirits. It probably means that the air is the place where such spirits live. We can't see them. And Satan is the prince of all those spirits, those evil spirits, and they have the air as their place of abode. And the Jews of Paul's day believed that the air was Satan's fear of dominion. And Paul lends support to that view. Paul evidently teaches it as a matter of a statement of fact, that that's his realm. And the word power means rule or dominion. Paul's point is that Satan is the ruler. He is the ruler of his sphere. He doesn't have power over the universe, but he has a certain power. Evil forces who reside in the atmosphere around the earth. And so we need to be aware of that. Other passages show that he and other wicked spirits under his authority do their work in the world, but in the world, and in this passage, Paul affirms that they have the air or the atmosphere around the earth as their place of abode. And even Christians, even Christians don't, str uh, don't struggle against flesh and blood, Paul said, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 2. So we notice that there. And so he's the father of the, all, evil, all the evil power. And darkness, of course, represents the realm of evil and ignorance and superstition. And in that sense, he rules over the dark world. So there's some things about Satan you may not have known. But there are various references like that. The devil's talked about more in the Bible than you think he is. And so their actual sphere of operation here is identified in this passage as in high places, in high places. And it's, that phrase is used several times, especially in the book of Ephesians. Sometimes it's used in heavenly places, not meaning uh, the third heaven, or not meaning the realm where God is, but in the atmosphere around the, around the earth. 
So here it simply means the unseen realm uh, in the world, including both good and evil forces. And uh, we learn that much about Satan from this verse. Now then, we notice also he's called the God of this world. And that's in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7, the God of this world. And so here in the New Testament, Satan is called a God. Did you know that? That Satan is called a God. Any attempt to try to apply this passage to the only true God rather than Satan has proved unsuccessful and it's unnecessary because the word is a fitting description of Satan when he's used as Paul. Uh, uh, Paul means for it to be understood. And you'll notice that a similar use of the word appears in Philippians where Paul says that certain Judaizers whose God is their belly. And the word God there is, of course, lowercase, not with a capital G. Whose God is their belly. You have the same, similar passage in Romans 16, verse 18, where it says, For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And the term belly there is a passage used to describe the desires of the flesh. Whatever the desires of the flesh are. To serve one's belly is to make one's fleshly desires one's God. And so the word God used in that sense, or the principal thing with him. Whatever your principal thing is in life, your main thing, that is your God. And we hope it's the God of heaven, Jehovah God. And so to serve one's belly is referring to you serving yourself. And so the word world in, in this sense, Satan is the God of this world that being spoken of there. So there's some things that we can learn about uh, Satan, and we'll try to catch this up here. Only place where Satan is called a God. And it refers to these desires in this world. We want to notice the next one, though. And this one is the fact that he is the deceiver of the whole world. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7, the whole world has plunged into sin because all those who are in the world have been deceived by the great dragon. Notice what else it says. The old serpent, he that is called the devil and Satan. And these last two terms tell us about the fact that he's the great deceiver. He is the deceiver, and he's man's accuser or slanderer. The word devil is, refers to man's accuser or slanderer, and he's man's arch adversary, and that's what's meant by the term Satan. He is our adversary. He's our opponent, our antagonist. Those are some words that would describe him. And so those two terms describe the two char true character of the one we're talking about tonight. As the deceiver of the whole world, it needs to be remembered that it was by deception that the world of mankind was plunged into sin, we're told in 1 Timothy 2.14. Satan deceived Eve in the garden. Deception. And he continues since that time to use that to try to control people on the earth. And it's by deception that the false religion symbolized by the beast out of the earth in Revelation chapter 13 and it's by deception that worldliness, which is signified in the book of Revelation by the harlot and the great city, seduces her victim. So if you expose and remove the deception, if you can do away with all the deception there, then its power is nullified. We've got to be more clever than the devil to not be deceived by him. Now, we notice an offer that Satan made to Jesus, and when we look at what Jesus was offered, and that thing's not repeating for some reason, the first temptation we look at and we raise the question, what was Jesus offered, or what was offered to Jesus? And the three temptations that were presented to him in that period, and we might just well turn there and read it, Matthew chapter 4, beginning at verse 1 through 11, then was Jesus led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he afterward hungered. And the tempter came and said unto him, If thou art the Son of God, notice that, if you're the Son of God, in other words, that's a challenge, whether you are or not, if you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him into the holy city, and he set him on the pinnacle of the temple, 
and saith unto him, if, if thou art the Son of God, there's that word if again, cast thyself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and on their hands they shall bear thee up, lest happily thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, Again it is written, Thou shalt not make trial of the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh him in unto an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. And he said unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came, and ministered unto him. Jesus told him to leave, and he left. We can do that too. All of us are more powerful than the devil. If not, he can overtake us against our will. There was a period of time he was allowed to do that in the first century through his demons, and people's bodies were overtaken, and they often did things they wouldn't normally do. And... Uh, Demons were cast out of people in the first century. But as we look at this particular temptation, what would Jesus, during his ministry, during the period of his earthly ministry, what was his personal lot? What would be his personal lot? Would he avoid suffering? You know, the devil's offering him something here whereby he can bypass his suffering and still get what's coming to him and this special power that he's going to be offered. So why would he, as the Son of God, have to suffer, uh, suffer hunger as other men do? Why does he have to do that? Couldn't he avoid that suffering through the use of his own power? Well, he had the power. He had the power to turn stones into bread. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been a temptation. If you don't have the, It's not a temptation to me to turn stones into bread. Because I know I can't do it. So I'm not tempted to do that. Not a temptation to me, but it's a temptation to one who can, but doesn't do it. And he could have done that. He could have done that. So Satan knew that he could do that. Satan had faith in the power of Jesus. He knew Jesus had the power to do that. Otherwise, he wasn't tempting the Jesus at all. And Jesus' response was that bread was important, but bread alone is not the important thing. And that's all physical things. Bread here is symbolic of all things physical in this natural world. And so he wouldn't use his divine power to satisfy a physical need, his own personal needs, just in order to avoid suffering. Now, when we look at the second temptation here, and the second one, would Jesus use spectacular displays to get a following? Well, surely his acclaim would have been... Uh, would have been great with the crowd. You can imagine the crowds already. He had drawn a lot of crowds. And if he cast him down from the highest point of the pinnacle of the temple and, safe, and God bore him safely to the ground without any harm to him, if he would leap from that wall, God would take charge. He would send the angels to bury him up, he's, the devil says. And that display would no doubt appeal to the messianic aspirations of the crowds. Remember what they were looking for? Well, they would see him as the one, he that should come, and they're looking at another kingdom like David's. That's what they're looking for. And Jesus would come and sit on that throne. But again, Jesus knew this was the easy way. This was the easy way in a way that uh, uh, would only be chosen by one who was determined to avoid the way of suffering. And Jesus could have done that if he had chose to do that. So to do what Satan suggested would actually put pressure would on, on him and, and presume that on God's favor by putting him in a situation to a test where his word would be challenged as to whether he kept his word. He refused to tempt God in this way. And so his spiritual needs were not to be accomplished by some unspiritual means. So Jesus didn't fall for that, literally, or physically. So as we look at the third temptation, would Jesus attempt to accomplish his mission through political power? That's what's being offered. He's allowed to look at all these kingdoms. 
all these cities and nations from a top of a high mountain. This was the kind of Messiah that the people were expecting. And they wanted. And so Jesus looked out from the high mountain where he had been taken. He looked past the landscape of all these political kingdoms, all the kings and all the people that were under them, and the, envisioned them at his feet. He could have that power. And at least that's what Satan intended for him to do. He offered Jesus all the kingdoms of this world. That's what he offered him. And the glory of them. Well, if he can have all that glory without him going to go to the cross, because he's going to get glory there if he goes through that. But here's a temptation to get that glory without going through the, through the cross. So we need to understand why these were such strong temptations when the devil offered him these things. Jesus wouldn't attempt to avoid suffering for selfish ambitions and uh, reasons like that. Love of power, desire to rule politically over others. Jesus didn't have that desire to rule politically over others. And he saw that to render to Satan, it would mean that. That it would mean that he had a divided loyalty and he couldn't accomplish his true mission except through complete trust in God and service to him. Jesus knew that. And so he was able to see through the devil's temptation. And that could only be accomplished through suffering. And we're going to see Jesus praying about that later, if there is any other way. And nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. So in this third temptation, Satan wasn't offering Jesus a way to accomplish his true mission. The devil wasn't say, didn't say, here's the way you can accomplish your true mission. He's trying to throw Jesus off of his mission. And so he was attempting to turn Jesus away from accomplishing that through worldly ambition. And so Jesus could, couldn't have saved one soul by establishing a worldly kingdom. Nobody had. All the kings that Israel had and that Judah had, none of them could save one soul. So it would have been a perversion of Jesus' mission and Satan's trying to get Jesus to look at what he can gain personally from it. And so Satan didn't take him to that high mountain to show him the souls of men. That wasn't why he took him up there, that he had come to save, but to show him all the kingdoms of this world and the glory of them. All that glitters is not gold, we sometimes say. It would have a, an attraction to you to say, boy, you can have all this. And as Luke 4 and verse 6 shows, it was the power and the glory of these worldly kingdoms that Satan offered to Jesus. And so from that high mountain, Jesus saw beautiful lands and towns and cities and mountains and beautiful landscape in addition to all the people of these kingdoms. And the temptation was to have authority to rule over all of that, to have power over all of that. Included in this was the kingdoms of this world and the glory of them. And that would accompany that with this vast political power and all the possessions that would come with that. Think about all that. What a temptation that would have been. Now then, our question that we need to raise is, could Satan have delivered that? Could he have delivered on his offer? I think that's a fair question to ask. Was Jesus, what was there an attempt at deception involved here? Remember, he's the deceiver. Satan is the old deceiver. Did Satan really have the power that he claimed when he said, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I will give it to whomever I wish? Luke 4 and verse 6 in the New American Standard. What's the likely answer to that question? Well, J. Dillman McGarvey in his commentary thought that Satan's promise to give Jesus the kingdom when considered in connection with the capacities of Jesus himself involves... No very arrogant assumption of power. Even though he said the whole world lieth in wickedness, it is not because Satan exercises in any sense absolute sway over the world. He could not give the domain and glory of the world to whomever he chose. And yet this is presumed in his offer to Jesus. So whatever ground he has gained in this world is not his by right. And another commentator said, uh, suggestion means that the devil's suggestion means that the kingdoms of this world have been rightly delivered to him by whom alone he alone possesses 
all things, and that is false. Satan doesn't possess all things. So his claim that the earth and all the kingdoms of this world and their glory had been delivered to him was partially true. And that's the way the devil works. He doesn't give you... He always wants to put a little bit element of truth in there to make it look like the real thing. It was partially true. That's the meaning of those passages we've already considered. But his claim that he could give it to whomever he will was false. He didn't have that power. He had a domain, but he didn't have the power to hand it off to whoever he wanted to. And so his lordship is limited in power and duration. But Garvey goes ahead to say this means that had Jesus met Satan's demands, he would have conceded that he did, in fact, own all this, the power over the kingdoms and the glory, and that he owned it by right. And this simply was not the case. There is no doubt that Satan's power is great, but there is a greater power, and Satan days were, Satan's days were numbered. So it was with half-truth and half-falsehood and using the messianic hope of Jesus' own people whom he had come to save, that Satan assaulted the integrity of Jesus in the hope of saving himself and his domain of darkness. End of quote. So I believe that accurately describes it. Satan used part truth and part falsehood and tried to deceive. That's the name of his game. And that's how he succeeds so many times. So Satan, in other words, was inviting Jesus to join forces with him. Think about that, that, that he offers him authority over the world. And in making that offer, he's not hoping to, re, to retain authority for himself and the rest of the universe. But he saw in his power a challenge. He saw a power, rather than lose it all, let's compromise. So the devil is offering Jesus a compromise there. And so... He's, uh, his attempt to compromise so that he wouldn't lose his entire domain. He would still have something. So uh, partial dominion is better than nothing at all. That's the way the devil is, is reasoning there. And McGarvey concedes that there was a, a way Jesus could have become a cohort with Satan and gained the prize that was offered to him. But for this to happen, he says, it would take more than Jesus simply surrendering and coming under the power and dominion of Satan. He says that it is quite certain that if he had consented and had not by this consent lost the power and wisdom which belonged to him, he could have attained in a short time uh, to universal dominion. So whatever success he would have had to this would have been due not to Satan's power alone, but to Jesus' own power and wisdom as well because there would have been a compromise going on there and they would have joined forces together. Is that what Jesus did? No, not on your life he didn't do that. And he didn't even consider seriously doing that. So where was the temptation? We need to raise that question. In what sense was this a temptation? Well, he's tempted to concede that Satan exercised absolute authority over the universe. That'd be one thing he'd be conceding. If he concedes that, it says that Satan is more powerful than the Lord. And so Jesus doesn't concede that. And so for one thing, he was tempted to concede that, and, and he's not willing to do that. And he didn't occupy the position of total lordship. Satan did not in the universe. So the, the point of the temptation lay in the design of it, of Satan spreading out at once a rushing picture of absolute sway. I'll give you this, like he owns everything when he didn't. And then also another aspect of this temptation the, where the devil hoped to uh, excite the worldly ambition of Jesus if he had that temptation. Jesus wasn't seeking that. When he came into the world, he came to seek and save the lost. He didn't come seeking worldly ambition. There were many occasions when he told people that had been healed not to tell anybody. If he had been seeking ambition, worldly acclaim, he would have said, you go tell everybody what I did. And Jesus never did anything like that for show. And so he could have retained part of the universe for himself if he had given in to that. So that would have thwarted Jesus' mission. And that shows us that the devil really is our adversary. And he's trying to thwart the mission of Jesus. So when we think about this and the worldly ambition and the attempt to try to thwart Jesus' mission, 
and what the devil was trying to do there, then we see the devil for who he is and the kind of uh, temptation that he put before Jesus. But let's look next at the fact that God still rules the world. And so what Satan offered Jesus was not really his to offer. He couldn't give it to whomever he would. And his domain was limited. He was called the prince of the power of the air, the atmosphere. And that's the domain of his demons. And so for a period of time, Satan was allowed to tempt Jesus 40 days and 40 nights. And Jesus withstood the temptations. Where would we be if he hadn't? Well, there wouldn't have been a resurrection, would there? And we would be of all men most miserable, the Bible says, if there is no resurrection. So God is still the ruler of the universe. And we need to understand that, that our faith shouldn't be shaken in the least. We see how to defeat Satan. And the best way to do that is look at what Jesus did and do it his way, by quoting scripture and later on by praying. Well, I hope this has helped you to learn some things about our adversary, the devil, and that we'll be aware of him and that we'll teach our children just as we would to warn them about some horrible person that has come in the area that's out to harm them. The devil is out to harm us, and we need to know that. This evening, if you haven't obeyed the gospel of Christ, what are you waiting for? We sometimes sing a hymn, Oh, Why Not Tonight? And one of the verses says that tomorrow's sun may never rise to bless thy long deluded sight. So sometimes we are deceived. We are deluded. It's the devil working. We need to recognize him for who he is. If you haven't repented of your sins and been baptized into Christ, we'd love to see you do that tonight. You need to do it for your own sake and out of appreciation for what the Lord has done for you. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, will you come as we stand and sing the hymn that's been selected?